Welcome to the Creative Piano Teaching Podcast, the place where teachers from around the world meet to share innovative ideas about music education. Listen and learn as we help you motivate your students, grow your income, expand your studio, and become a more creative piano teacher. Hi, everyone, and welcome to episode 85 of the Creative Piano Teaching Podcast, and a special welcome to all my Inner Circle members who are listening. Thanks for tuning in today, as always, wherever you are in the world and whatever you're up to. My name is Tim Topham, and I'm the teacher behind the Creative Piano Teaching Podcast. This is the place where you can get weekly inspiration, ideas, and actionable teaching strategies to help you provide the richest, most exciting, and fun learning experiences for your students. As always, full show notes and a transcript and our freebie for today's episode are available at timtopham.com slash episode 85. Today's podcast is all about keeping ideas fresh for recitals and some of the things that you can do to easily spice up, reinvigorate and get your kids and parents, because that's pretty important, inspired by your piano recitals. And you're going to love today's freebie. It's a one-page cheat sheet to help you get started organizing your first pop showcase recital, which we're going to be discussing in today's episode. And next month, we're actually going to dive much more deeply into this idea of modern pop recitals as I share with you my own experience from running my first pop showcase concert last year. So it'll be a couple of blog posts and perhaps a podcast focusing solely on the pop showcase. And in that You'll actually be able to see images of me working with my students, rehearsing, and some of the final product as well. So I hope you enjoy that. It's coming up next week. Uh, Sorry, next month. For today's freebie, though, just heading to timtopham.com slash episode 85 will get you the download link. Today's episode is actually a rebroadcast of an interview that I recorded back in the episode 12 I know that many people wouldn't have heard the original interview because it's going on almost two years now since we actually broadcast it. And look, it's so full of great ideas for this month's theme, exploring recitals and exams, that I decided we should definitely have another listen. So in this episode, we're going to be talking about why you should be rethinking how you organize recitals and how you can rebrand and reconsider the opportunities that you have for your students there. We're going to talk about some simple ideas about ways to theme recitals and even talking about something called art fusion and how you could integrate that into your concerts. We'll talk about how you can get even absolute beginners involved in a pop showcase recital. We're going to talk about uh, how to fund your recitals things to do when you're charging parents, notifications, all that kind of stuff, where to look for great venues if you're not hosting them at home, and generally how to make recitals more relaxed and fun for your students, and just as importantly, to keep your parents engaged. Now, we've just talked last week with uh, Shana Kirk about some technology applications for recitals. And it's interesting how there's a little bit of crossover with this episode in some of the themes that she's talking about. So I think you're going to really like the fact that yeah, last week we were talking about technology. This week, we're not talking about technology, although we do incorporate it in some aspects. Uh, But really, it's just about simple things that you can do to change up your recitals for your students. So I hope you enjoyed today's interview. Here is Kristen Yost. All right, let's get to meeting uh, Kristen. Uh, Many of you will know uh, Kristen already. She's a prolific blogger. She's a sought-after presenter. She's a book author. And I don't know how you do it all, but in her spare time, it seems, she's executive director uh, and a piano teacher at the Centre for Musical Minds, uh, which is a music uh, school she founded with Dr. Sam Holland in 2008 in Frisco, Texas. She holds a BA and an MM in piano performance and pedagogy. Uh, and she's an active presenter and mentor in areas of music business. In fact, her book, which is called How I Made $100,000 My First Year as a Piano Teacher, I just love that title, so good, <laughs> made a huge splash when released on Amazon and continues to motivate and challenge teachers around the world. And I met Kristen at the NCKP this year where one of her talks was with a, uh, a couple of other people actually, all about piano recitals. And it was so good, Kristen. So welcome today uh, and thank you very much for being here. Well, thank you so much for having me. You're really welcome. And particularly given our time zone differences, it's like <laughs> the night with you. I've just come home from work. Um, so like, it's really, really great. And it's lovely to catch up with you again. We had such fun at uh, the NCKP. It was great. Yeah, it was a great time. So today we're talking recitals. And my first question for you is, 
why do you feel that there's actually a need for teachers to consider how and why they run recitals and perhaps con- consider changing things up? Well, I think it's part of the growth that we are experiencing as musicians and as teachers, or we should be experiencing as musicians and teachers. It's part of the natural evolution, I think, of, of our profession. It's part of the engagement process for audiences. Um, As we saw so many symphonies fail financially a few years ago, I think we we learned that the music is not just for us, it's for our audience and for the people who are participating in those types of events and the people who are buying tickets to those events. Um, And when it comes to teaching, we have to consider who our clients are and who our students are um, and that it's about them and what their interests are. And as a musician, we can like other genres besides classical music. <laughs> I, I think in academia, we, we forget that a little bit. Yeah. Well, I think, and we're kind of making an assumption here, which we should probably discuss straight up, that we're assuming that most teachers run classical recitals. Do you think that's the majority. a fair, a fair statement? I, I do. I think that is pretty fair. It it is changing though. I have noticed more of an interest, especially in the pop recital since I've been giving presentations on it. Um, So in the last five years, the interest has certainly gone gone up substantially and I'm seeing more people doing it now, Hmm. which is exciting. Absolutely. Yeah. And what do you think the benefits are for the students in a non-traditional piano recital? Well, it's important for them to feel engaged. So it, it's their language. It's their, popular music is the native language that most of our students are speaking. And it's a little bit like show and tell, especially for younger students. Um, you know, they want to bring their, their shiniest, most favorite toy and show their peers, right? So they don't want to, to pull out the third string teddy bear because mom and dad won't let them bring their other shiny toys. Um, And I think that popular music is a little bit like that shiny toy. So making that come to life is really important um, to them as well as their parents. We had this ice storm in Dallas that shut the city down in 2013. The whole city, I mean, when I say the city shut down, it shut down for days because of ice. And we had our pop showcase during the ice storm and we didn't cancel it. I didn't actually know that we were being iced in at the time, but what took, what should have taken 35 to 45 minutes to get to the the venue took some people almost three hours, but oh, they risked their lives literally <laughs> <laughs> to come to this, this piano recital, this pop recital, um, because they know how meaningful that experience is to the kids to make their songs, their favorite music come to life with a rhythm section. Um, and the parents, you know, spent five, six hours on the road so that Johnny could spend two minutes and 20 seconds <laughs> playing <laughs> pop tune with a rhythm section. So. But it, well, it just goes to show the, uh, the respect, I guess, with which those recitals are held in your, Absolutely. In your music center. Yeah. Absolutely. So let's, I'll play devil's advocate for a moment. Is there any point in piano recitals? Should we be worrying about them? There are a lot of hassle to organize whether they're classical or not. Should we just like <laughs> just chuck them out? Just throw it out the window? Yeah. I, don't th- I don't think so. I'm not ready to do that yet. And why not? You just think that well, like there's a lot of meaning still that students can get from it or is it actually I, a bit about the parents and what they experience? Part of that. There is an element of what the parents, you know, they... I like a lot of performance experiences. Um, So in terms of having one traditional recital per year or per semester, I think it actually does more damage than it does good because it increases the anxiety levels. It's like a one and done type of thing. Oh, you've been working for, you know, eight months just for this one moment. And then it's like anything can happen. So the more we make performance experience as part of the natural process of learning music, the more enjoyable they become and, and the more open the kids are to all kinds of different genres. Mm. So I'm not ready to give up yet. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, it's, it's good. I, 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 I throw it out there because I was interested to see what you'd say. <laughs> I'm, actually, I'm actually giving a classical concert on September 9th. <laughs> oh, there we go. We'll put a plug in for that at the end for sure. Yeah. <laughs> um, it, it's, it's interesting because I, I think I, I teach a lot of teenagers, as most people know, and they can be really reticent to play at piano recitals 
uh, for so. those kind of, you know, it's like, it's, it's terrifying. And, and I think, and I wonder what your opinion is. Do you think that the fact that no one goes to classical recitals or very few people, certainly negligible number of young people that I know go to classical piano recitals, do you think mm-hmm. that has an impact on their view of the piano recital? Whereas perhaps oh, if they went to more poppy ones and stuff, they'd be like, oh, actually, this is kind of cool. Exactly. I do. I feel like the classical recitals are, it's kind of like the, and this is maybe not the best analogy, but I think of it as like a trained monkey, right? It's like you put the trained monkey that you taught all these tricks to onto this very lonely stage. And then you're, you're expected to do your tricks. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think that's entirely ridiculous that that's our ex- level of expectation of our students. There's an element of performance. There's an element of discipline. There's an element of preparation that it all comes together. And, and when it goes well, it's just, it's like magic. Um, so there are elements to those types of performances, but they don't have to be dreadful. And that's where I think pop music really catches the student's interest and it makes it more accessible. It's like, oh, I understand what's going on here. And when people are allowed to move freely, I love to see people move to the music. You know, I sit next to some people and they just, it's like, you really want to do something. Like, can you not feel it? Um, so I, I feel like the, the whole tone of the classical performances, as long as they're evolving and they're allowing people to move and to be expressive in the audience, I think it makes everyone feel more welcome. Mm, yeah, it's that kind so, of like yes. like, you know, yes. like, just can't move. When do I clap? I don't know. Or like, right. <laughs> yeah. It's horrible, isn't it? Yeah, it is yeah. horrible. Yeah. And, and I guess, you know, I, I think about it as being, well, maybe, you know, there's elements of that that we should teach our, our students should know not to clap during the movements. And then I think, does it really, does it really matter? Does it in really the matter? <laughs> in the, no. no. The answer is no. <laughs> let's, let's talk about the music and, and giving people a love for music. I think that's what it comes right. down to. Yeah. Exactly. All right. Well, let's get into it. I want to I pick your brains about some ideas here. Um, so as I mentioned at the start, I saw you present at uh, the NCKP and you gave, like, there was just... It was an hour's worth of fantastic ideas, so we probably can't go through them all. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, do you want to just start with, with a few of your, like, best ideas about recitals? Or we could go straight to the thing we uh, alluded to at the beginning, which is a pop showcase. Up to you. Sure. I can touch on what we did. We, you know, we talked about the arts fusion that we've done and that we're going to continue to do. Okay, well, um, you better explain what that means. So arts fusion is when you're combining different mediums. So you have music and, as an example, um, visual art. So um, Todd Van Kekerix actually talked about what the New School for Music Study did um, and how they had a theme and the kids could come up with art to represent whatever piece you know, they were playing. Or they even had a concert um, where there was a live painter really just taking, you know, it's her, it's her visual representation of that event and, and what was going on. So that's pretty cool. Um, I have actually worked with a local artist uh, on, and she creates um, paintings based on our project as the WC Preludes okay. um, and then his first arabesque. So having concerts that are incorporating some visual elements as well as the, the aural, the musical elements, um, so arts fusion is one. I personally love visual art, so I'm that's one of my favorites. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, it's yeah. something I've never tried and I never thought of before I heard of this. And there are so many creative ways to go about it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But I, I'm picturing so there's there's a student playing the piano, or is there mm-hmm. a series of students playing different pieces and one drawing for the whole lot of pieces, or or one well, one, one player, one artwork? Both. You can do it either way. Okay. Um, some how, pieces are obviously quite short and. You might yes. only get a few brush strikes on it. Might <laughs> right. <be. laughs> right. Well, when you have a live painter, it's going to be a collection of everybody's, it's going to be an energy in the room. It's going to be, you know, the lighting, it's going to be the atmosphere. It's going to be the music inspired. And then they can, you know, um, I've seen people create like cards from the events or um, they make up prints so you can buy it and you can frame it uh, as kind of a souvenir kind of thing that you, that you have from that event. But it can be what you want it to be as long as you have a vision for it. Um, on September 9th, actually, Misty. So we're premiering two paintings and two preludes to go along with the paintings right. at our concert. So it's just fun. So you're doing exactly this. You're having two paintings made uh-huh. on the spot. 
Wow. Yes. Very cool. Are you going to film yeah. it or anything like that? It'd be fascinating to. to we see. could. Yeah, it's, we it could. It could be a good idea because, like, it's kind of a bit mind blowing. I'm sure teachers listening will be going, "Wow, that's I've never thought of doing that." Yeah. Yeah. Kind of well, cool. and then you get get more people involved, especially in especially kids who have interest, or or anybody in the community who attends who has an interest in in visual art um, and the process of creation. I think it's really neat. The idea is to keep it, you know, under an hour or so because otherwise it just becomes, you know, one of these types well, of things. Attention spans are shorter the <laughs> right. times, aren't they? Uh, and where do you find artists and do they do it for free? Um, it depends on, uh, you can actually set up, um, there was one event that I went to where it was, um, it was a fundraiser. Uh, someone had actually passed away. And so the event was a memorial service and there was a live painter there. And so all of the proceeds for any of the art sales went to her memorial fund. Okay. Um, my friend Misty and I, we worked together and I've commissioned a couple paintings, but then this one is just going to be for fun. And then if people like it, then they can buy it from her. So she'll make something off of that and i imagine if you use students from the school or friends of the piano students maybe they'd be happy oh, yeah. to do it for free because it's fun they do yeah the kids especially yeah yeah, yeah. okay yeah. great so there's one great idea for everyone listening having right. uh, an artwork produced at the same time as a piano recital yeah. great great cool exactly. all right keep them coming what's next what, what right. else so that was that was Arts, Arts Fusion. Uh, you know, probably the most traditional option out there is going to be the collaborative recital. So you can do, I recommend experimenting with more than just the piano, or if it's going to be piano, not actually having siblings, but having peers, so, you know, students who are around the same age working together and or parents. It's always really fun to me to see parents that play with their kids, whether it be they play piano and their child plays a different instrument because they are probably, a lot of them are in band and orchestra as well, or singing or bringing in a completely different instrument and having the kids accompany each other. There's this, uh, this one woman who has these recitals in Austin and she's a, um, she's a piano teacher, but she hires the violinists to come. And so that the kids are learning how to accompany out of the wow. Suzuki books. Right. Yeah. So really neat, great skill sets that, that come along. Yeah. So that's collaborating is wonderful in different ways. You know, you can always do trios and duos and quartets and things like that. So that's also a great option. Yeah. I just like to push the, push the boundary a little bit more yeah it's great well I, like a, a lot of my sort of ability to sight read and and be a sort of good ensemble performer has come from accompanying so to give students yes. that chance early uh-huh. on is great it's a, such a good skill right uh, so there's a collaborative i'm drawing a blank on what that middle one was <laughs> but then we we had um we had, a, we had keyboard jams and a pop showcase so the difference between a keyboard jam and a pop showcase is a keyboard jam is a kid event. So the parents aren't allowed to come okay. and listen. It's just, it's like a concert for kids. And and they get to go through it a couple times. So instead of just a one and done, you know, you go through it. There is, because for our pop showcases, we don't actually do rehearsals. Um, but the keyboard jam, they get it. I thought I just heard you say, <laughs> for your pop showcase recitals, you don't do rehearsals. We don't. Back it up. Oh, hang on. Let's get to that in a second. <laughs> let's, let's do the, key, the, the jam one first. Uh, so the keyboard jam, they bring their chord chart, they've got their, their tune, their song, whatever it is they're doing. And they have, they have at least two times to go through it. So, um, there's, there's going to be a teacher who's going to be coaching and then we, we involve the musician. So we ask them questions and we, we have interaction between the student and the musicians who are all professionals. Um, and then the audience, uh, bass and drums, bass, drum, and guitar. Okay, so you hire three professionals Mm -hmm. to come in and play and the kid gets two chances to play each piece. So one's like, is that what you mean? At the recital sort of thing. Yeah, So you kind of see the process of the group working together and that's why you call it a jam, I guess. Yes, exactly. Versus the pop showcase, which is all preparation beforehand. And then everything you see in those videos, (laughs) right, everything you see in our pop showcase videos is... That's it. Right. Okay. So they, they count off, they practice counting off. The guys okay, know when to hang on, hang on. We've got to start at the beginning of this. So the <laughs> so okay, the pop showcase thing now. Now this is the coolest <laughs> idea because I, I really love this. So how does it work? What 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 do you how do you teach? What or what do you teach? Do all the kids learn pop or just a few of them? 
Well, yes. So anybody who comes to the Center for Musical Minds knows that they're signing up for a, com- it's a combination. You're going to be learning the traditional classical um, familiar repertoire, as well as the, the standard classical repertoire as you advance right alongside of contemporary music. So that means whatever is going on currently. And you actually make that a clear expectation right at the beginning. Parents see it. Very so much so. You're uh-huh. actually going to be learning a mix of things. Yes. I think that's great. Yes. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, so it really is very, it's very balanced. Um, because I teach popular music, I'm oftentimes labeled as someone who's a pop teacher, which means that automatically, you know, they default to, oh, well, you must not be a serious teacher, which is completely false because it's not either or, it can be both. Mm. Um, and so the pop showcase is a culmination of everything I think that it means to be a musician. So the kids are involved in the chord chart writing process. Um, the, the middle school and the high school students learn the Nashville number system of making the chord chart. Um, well, I don't and, know. Being an Aussie, I don't know what that means. What does that mean? Well, you know how if you're playing off of a, um, a jazz chart, yeah. they get the letters. Yeah. Well, if you're, if you're with the Nashville number system, instead of Roman numerals, they give you the numbers. So it's telling you which chord you're going to be playing. Like instead of a one or a five Roman numerals, it's yep. telling you one or five. So it's really easy to go in so between. Like the, like normal. The actual number. Right. Yeah. Okay. So the same thing yeah. as Roman numerals, except written like normal. Like normal. Like Arabic right. numerals. Yeah. Normal. Yeah. Yes. Okay. okay. <laughs> All right, I'm with you. Uh, it's, 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 it's great. Um, so all kinds of theory form analysis that goes into that, mm-hmm. uh, because a lot of times, um, there will be chords written, but there'll be the letters. Right. And so we, we do it both ways. Would you, would you have an example of one of those sheets that I could share with people? Not right now, but uh, on the, yeah, that'd be cool to see. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Um, no problem. A lot of them are handwritten. Actually, most of them are handwritten. Some teachers take it really seriously and they, they actually like write out lead sheets and stuff. But yeah. um, these guys are professionals. So the guitar player that I hire regularly, he actually was running Michael Bublé's band last year. Wow. On, and he was running his European tour. They know how to play, right? Yeah, and they're absolutely. really, really good listeners. So the key to, to, to not having rehearsals is the preparation and the musicians that I hire. Okay. Now, before we go into that, let's just back up a bit because I want to make sure we get it right. Um, uh-huh. So let's say I'm a teacher at your school uh, mm-hmm. and I get, you know, a kid that's learning six years and they're playing kind of intermediate classical stuff uh, and they just moved to your studio. Uh-huh. So me as a teacher, I know that, I, yeah, I can keep going with that classical stuff, but actually I need to do some contemporary music too. So everyone yes. learns at least one or is it multiple pop songs with these lead charts and they help put them together. So they all just yes. one? Multiple. Multiple. It's part of the, yeah, we, we make it part of their native language. Great, great. Really cool. I'm, you know, I'm a firm mm-hmm. believer in that, that too. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, midway through the year or whenever it is, you go, right, the showcase time. So, uh, so you hire three professional musicians mm-hmm. and they come to the recital and the kid is prepared enough that they can get up on stage and play along with that, that trio. Right. And they count off. They count them off. Yeah. Okay. So let's, <laughs> which talk about, is really fun. Uh, let's talk about the preparation. How do you get them to the stage where they don't freak out? They know what to do. They can stay in time, all that kind of stuff. <laughs> do you, have you got some tools that you use? It's a process. Absolutely. Um, Super Metronome Groovebox is, a, is it's the longest app <laughs> titled in, app. <laughs> in the world. Um, but Super it's Metronome a great Groovebox. App. That's right. It's cool. a it's a mouthful. I have the paid version because okay. then it just it goes on, and there are just more options, and it's really really inexpensive. It's like the best three dollars and ninety nine cent app that I think I've ever purchased. So I use Super Metronome Groovebox a lot, and What's the I have between that. Sorry to interrupt, and and another yeah, metronome app. Well, this actually is a beat, so okay. you you actually feel the big beats and what they're supposed to be doing, you know, because when it's pop rhythms, they're going to be playing syncopated and we don't want them to play like you're a classically trained. Yes, exactly. So we want them to fit their, their syncopations in the bigger beats. Um, So there's that element. And, and that's taking, you know, one hand at a time. Well, I usually it's having the student play the melody and then I'll play like a shell of fifths or octaves or whatever the case is just to give it a, a foundation and then we put that together with the beat or I have a really nice um a Roland keyboard that also has beats that I can 
pull up really easily. Um, so they get, they get accustomed to doing that. I oftentimes will make a track in GarageBand and just play the harmonies and add a little bit of melody in there so they can play along with that at home. And they'll have a slow speed and medium speed and a performance speed. Okay. And the key to really the key to any, I think any successful performance, whether it be classical pop or otherwise is going to be the student can take it apart. So in addition to being able to play the performance speed, they're also practicing regularly at slow speeds and at medium speeds, even though they, they reach the, the faster speed, because when you play with other musicians, you've got to have, you've got to be really solid. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then, and then you see the kids, you know, the, the kids who aren't scared to death, they, they always smile after, but the kids who are really having a good time are smiling like when they actually when they hear hear the band with them. Yeah. 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 Do any of them sing or do they mainly play the melody and chords? What do they do on the piano? Yeah, we do have some students who sing as they play, in which case we are teaching accompanying patterns as, as mm-hmm. part of that and how to figure out where their voice and what key to mm-hmm. for it to be in. And when you're using the Nashville system, it's really easy to once you have that chord chart to maneuver into different keys. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Okay, so, and if they're not singing, uh, what are they generally playing? What part of the music? Well, they'll play the melody. And so we usually get, we, we'll get music from musicnotes.com or how Leonard has, the, um, they're publishing, I forget what it's called, but the pop chart the pop, hit. Pop piano hits? Yes, yeah, exactly. Yeah, like so they've got so great, yeah. yeah. And those are, you know, even, even though they're easier notated arrangements, when I teach pop music, I very rarely have the student read the bass. So we're showing them how to play fifths and octaves. And then, and that's also a different, there are different styles of playing. When you're playing with the rhythm section, you have a bass player, your left hand doesn't, doesn't have to do so much. That's true. So we, you know, we do make the melody a little more interesting. We can add some inner notes. Oftentimes we'll add the alto part in there or the second voice part. Um, we can take it up an octave. So they're learning a little bit about arranging and kind of orchestration, but right. it's primarily that. Yeah. Yeah. So for some teachers, um, might be listening and their brain's just exploding and they've kind of shut down because they're like, this is all <laughs> I can't, I can't do this. And I like, I can easily see that. Um, when, how, how do you start? Like, let's say you've, you've, um, you know, you've got some new teachers at your school. They haven't done much of this before. Just really quickly, just a few tips. C- can they start by teaching students reading something like the How Leonard Pop Piano Hits? Yeah, it's a great by place ear? to start. What are they, what should you do? I, I would say that's a great place. Those How Leonard books are a great place to start. Okay. Um, or if it's a really beginning student and they're going to just play a verse and a chorus, you know, you don't have to play the whole thing. Um, so oftentimes you can play a little intro, a verse, uh, a chorus, put a little something in there and then take it out. So the out chorus, right? So they get a little bit of, of length in there and they can just play a single note. Um, in the left hand if they want to. So there's that element. You have to play with rhythms. You can't just put a metronome on. Um, it's not the same thing. Mm-hmm. It's not as it's not nearly as effective, especially for the little ones. And the people who are just starting out playing popular music, whether they're coming at it in, in middle or high school, or they're starting from the you know very beginning, the sooner they play with rhythms, the easier it is. Do you mean play with popular rhythms, like stuff that uh-huh. comes up in music, even though we'd look at it and go, oh, my God, that's too hard. They can't never do that. Right. And playing that along with, and don't get bogged down in the syncopations. Let them play it how they hear it, so long as yeah. they're fitting it in with the big beats, which okay. is why they need to play with the, the beats in the background. Yep, yep, I'm with you. Yeah, I like that. I, I advocate that idea of just let students play. If they know the song, they'll know the rhythm. Yes. Give them the notes. They'll figure it out. Play it. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Don't yeah. freak out. Teachers, you have permission from both of us. <laughs> you don't have to read every dot and dash no. on the music. Please I, don't. <laughs> I, don't I, I, can't, I can't read half the music transcriptions that are in now there for pop music. It's no. Fantastic. Well, it's not made for solo piano, so we mm. have to adapt from there, yeah. Yeah, exactly. exactly. All right, yeah. I'm with you. All right, so you've got the, the kids are ready. Now tell me about the uh, performance. Why don't, why don't I just get my, my, you know, my brother, little brother to play bass or whatever uh, or the, <laughs> the guy down at, I don't know, <laughs> down the road? If you have all kinds of rehearsal time and all kinds of time that you can volunteer to facilitate those rehearsals, I say great. <laughs> Let everybody 
let everybody just have a great experience. Yeah. Um, but I want it to be an experience that they remember and that is meaningful to them. So they've made their song come to life. And in doing so, they've got to have somebody who can follow whatever they, if they drop a beat or they add a beat, I need somebody who's going to drop it and add it right along with them. Right. Um, so they, they do it for free. I know they would, but I would never ask them to play for free. Yeah. Okay. Yep. All right. And so that begs the next question, I guess, is how do you afford to pay professional musicians? Let's say I don't know anyone and I have to kind of just look online to find people and uh-huh. they're like, it's going to cost 200 bucks or whatever it is. Uh-huh. How do, how do you cover that? That's great. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> 500 bucks, whatever it is. I don't know. <laughs> uh, no, you have to show the, the value of the experience and then like for us, ours is built into our annual enrollment fee. Okay. So it's about $25, the equivalent of 20 or 20, depending on how many students are participating between 20 and $25 for, for the cost breakdown per student. And, and if you're looking at, we have all of these music teacher festivals that they'll pay 20 or $30 to participate in to go and play for a judge and get comments. So I've never actually had anybody in the Seven years we've been doing this. Eight years we've been doing this. I've never had a single person complain about it. And and so you, for teachers that are just starting, mm-hmm. let's say they're really excited and they've already put their tuition out for the year because you guys are about to go back to school, I know, and we're in the middle of winter sort of term. Let's say they're really excited and they want to do it. Could they charge for, you know, if they made a convincing case, and I know you've got a uh-huh. video that can help that, could they just say, look, it's going to be 20 bucks entry effectively? Do you think you've done that before? Yes, yeah. absolutely. Okay, great. It's, it, you know, you have to show them, you have to educate them. So you have to communicate what it is you're going to be doing and the value of what it is you're going to be doing. Hmm. Show them some examples. And I would be extremely surprised if, if the majority of people didn't say, sign us up. How much do we owe you? Where do we send the check or, you yeah. know. But particularly, I assume after one, after you've done one anyway, and the word gets out. Right. It's like, yeah. Yes. It's yeah. huge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, you had a fantastic video. It just about made me cry. Um, but you played at the uh, your presentation um, at the last conference. It was showing the teacher's reaction and showing kids oh, yeah. on stage and things. Is that something that's online that I could share with people that they it could is. use to help educate their, as you say, educate their parents? Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah, so we can put is. a link to that on our show notes page. Yep, that that's no be, problem. That would be a great help. So this video, uh, for those of you who weren't there, just it it it's, it was really professionally done, and it just it, it interviews parents about their experience, shows mm-hmm. kids playing, it shows what it looks like and how it works. I thought it was really really good. Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> it's great. Okay, so we'll definitely get a link to that. Yeah, that's uh, great. Okay, so we've got four good. I yeah, really good sort of ideas. And I think the other one, you mentioned that you fell on the middle one. I think it might've been about themes. Perhaps. It was, I remembered. Yeah. yeah, a yeah. Couple of like you had it's colors about, and. Yeah. Things, just yeah. different. Right. It's, it's having a themed event. So it could be a Disney concert recital, or it could be um, like Ryan, it was Ryan Green who, it, I think it was Sonatina in colors and he played yellow. Um, and so he created a slideshow to go with all things that reminded him of yellow that that we scrolled through during his performance um we have we do a grammy performance <clears throat> excuse me as well and the grammys are it's a kid concert but they all play you know something that is artist quality you know, if we talk about the grammys it's a great education process and they, they get you know artist of the year and they win a recording contract so they can oh, uh, That's cool. so, yeah so just kind of thinking outside of uh, or, or a decade, right? So thinking outside of the traditional, very square, narrow box. Okay. <laughs> the, ty- the tired box. <laughs> yeah. What, what would be in the tired box? Just so I know if I'm tired. <laughs> a, a, a standard classical hour and 15, 20 minute uh, recital where, you it's know, just, everybody's it's just, it's just counting classical. down. Okay, yeah. okay. No, I thought you were mentioning, uh, making, uh, I thought you were saying that there are themes that are a bit tired. Oh. Like everyone does the Wild West or... No, if everybody's... No, I wouldn't do like a genre. I wouldn't do an all classical recital unless you're going to have costumes involved or you're going to have like if you're going to do a Baroque type of thing, make it 
make it more interactive. And so there's going to be, there's a storyline that goes along with it. That can actually be great if you do, if you present the good. Yeah. All right. No, this is so good. So many ideas. I really love it. Uh, I've got, I'm thinking, um, oh yeah, space now. That's kind of the next thing, I guess. So um, I remember my, my teacher when I was young, she used to squeeze all of us like, I don't know, there would have been 60 or something people in her house and she'd open all the uh-huh. doors and we'd be out in the kitchen and all this. Kind of stuff. <laughs> yeah. Um, what, uh, how can, because I assume you'd need a, you know, a, a decent number of students performing to make it financially viable and to, to make it a fun event or maybe not. Um, what would, would you say you need sort of a, a bulk number, like five kids isn't enough but 20 is so good because it's a great crowd or... Yeah. Well, whenever I do house concerts, I always limit it to 10 or 12. So it has to be small. Um, When it comes to the pop showcases, we have done those, the keyboard jam we can do just in the house, in a house too, because it's just the kids. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, but as far as space, you know, there are some really wonderful public libraries that have grand pianos that you can oftentimes taxpayer dollars have funded them. So you just have to get on the list. You may have to bring in a keyboard and set that up, which that's the, that's the challenge. It's always, for me, it's always a challenge of, okay, where can we find a nice instrument that because they're not used to playing on keyboards. If 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 they're going to perform on a keyboard, I would make sure that they played on a keyboard yeah, sure. because it's so different. Yeah. Or you know, churches are great if you're a member of a church. Um, universities, schools, depending yeah. on how the school rental system, um, the hall system works, those are great options. Community centers, like we have a senior center in in Frisco that I could. I could rent out for the whole day for like a ridiculously cheap amount. Yeah. So, so about they're, thinking, they're yeah, thinking a little bit out, outside the, the box. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and I guess the cost of that and do, do the professional musicians bring their own amplifiers and things like that or yeah. do you need to supply that too? No, they bring everything. Okay. But if mm-hmm. the pianist wants to sing, you'd probably need a mic and a little yes. PA of some sort. Uh huh. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So all of that you just have to take into consideration. So the cost of the musicians, any equipment, the hire, and then uh-huh. divide that by the number of parents. Right. Exactly. You know, and, and chances are the professional musicians, they would have a, if, if you're friends with them or if you know them from whatever organization, they will probably have access to a vocal mic and an amp if you, if you really yeah, sure. need to do that. Otherwise, you're looking at probably $100 for, for a vocal mic, just like a, like the sure, it's a nice, mm-hmm. nice uh, vocal mic. Um, you'll need a, a stand for the mic and then you'll need like a, I have a Roland cube, which was like $200, but you can, you know, you can get something in that price range. So you're looking at for an initial investment, you shouldn't have to spend more than $400 tops. Yeah. Okay. It's good. It's really exciting. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I really, really yeah. like the ideas. It's really good. And you've been doing this for sort of seven or eight years. Is that right? Uh, yeah. Yes, exactly. And do they, the get, first, do they get bigger? The first one or? didn't have a band. Okay. Well, the, yeah, I've gotten it down to, I have a day of show document. So I've gotten it down to a science. <laughs> what, what's a day of show document? What does that mean? A day of show document, I highly recommend anybody who's coordinating any type of event that involves more than two people have a day of show <laughs> document. Okay. So um, it just lists the location because oftentimes it's in a different location. It lists the address. It lists the telephone number of the, the venue, who the contact is at the venue, what time the doors will be open. Um, if they're not open, whose mobile number do you have to call? Mm-hmm. Arrival times of the musicians, their cell phone numbers, if they're not there and you need to call them or you need to text them. And then it has anybody who has a leadership or a coordinating role in the event, all of their contact information is listed. And then there's a timeline of what needs to happen and when. Because I, I program close. Okay. So. Yeah, right. And how, and how many of these pop showcases do you do each year? Well, we do one pop showcase okay. uh, per year, and on that day, it has five separate shows. Okay, so and it's, they it's run a weekend then, like a Saturday yeah. or a Sunday. Yeah, it's an all day. Like we start at ten thirty in the morning. We have food for the musicians and the teachers, so everybody wow. can take 
short breaks. Um, but it's a, we knock it out. Okay. Now don't freak out everyone listening or watching because <laughs> you don't all have that many students, of course. So um, just so we don't freak everything, everyone out, uh, let's just, can I kind of pick your brains for where, where should, for, should teachers start? So let's say there are um, people listening. Um, one of them are like, yeah, this, this sounds really cool. Can you just take me through first couple of steps? What, what should I, what should I do? Sure. You know, if you're, if you're getting your feet wet, I would say start small, you know, it doesn't even have to be a studio wide event. Um, you can, if this is really your first venture into it, um, it depends on your level of comfort in, in popular music. So obviously you're going to have to look at some, some resources, musicnotes.com and the Hal Leonard pop hits. Mm-hmm. I think you, yep. 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 I'll put links to both of those. On. Yeah. Yep. Those are really the two best places. There's lots of contemporary Christian music that's going to sound great. Hal Leonard, I think, has the publication rights on those too. There's a great book that I, I can't think of the title, but I could I could get it tomorrow. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's it's playing around with, and when I say playing around, it's it's learning how to make make popular music sound good. You know, popular music that's been it's on the radio with 20 different musicians and making that solo piano arrangement stand alone and still sound good Mm. and musical. So you've got that element and then starting to play with rhythms, like having the students play along with rhythms. Those Mm. are the two, the two first steps. Before you even think about the recital. Don't even plan it until you've done this. Right. Okay. And uh, I'll give a plug for my own online training. So for teachers that are a little bit unsure about teaching pop, full stop, you're classically trained and have no idea, happy to put your hand up and say, I need some help. Uh, (laughs) I do have some online training and I'll put a link to that. You can watch uh, a number of videos of me going start to finish, how do you actually teach pop? So that's like a check. We can get you organized for teaching it. So then they go, all right, I've got some students that can do it. I guess Uh the next step is setting a date, finding a venue, finding some musicians and getting Mm -hmm. the kids to practice with some of these apps that can help. Right. Right. If you have, if you have good musicians, I would actually schedule the musicians, find a date that works for them first, rather than picking the date and seeing if it works for them. I actually plan it around the three guys that I always hire. I always make sure that I can get them. Yeah. No, it's good. Um, You've got a relationship with them and they know how it works, obviously. Yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. No, oh, that's great. Oh, so, so good. Uh, I've, I reckon this has been such a great episode for just new, fun, new ideas. Uh, and good. there was so much talk uh, at the last conference, the NCKP, about just getting creative in lessons. Right, uh, right. That, uh, you know, this is just one one of those ideas that you could take and you don't have to completely revolution, revolutionize your teaching either. You, you've made no. it really clear from the beginning. You still teach classical. I still teach classical. Pop yes. is just one aspect, one element of a holistic right. education. Absolutely. It's essential. Mm. Yeah. It and, really is. Essential. Yeah, and you can teach uh, so much through it about chords and progressions and all those musical construction elements. And I think that's right. what's really crucial too. Yeah. Right. All right. So any, anything we've missed uh, before we start wrapping up? I don't think so. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's a great experience. It is, it, if you do it, if you do it well, it can be the most valuable experience that you give to your student base. Wow. That's really powerful. Yeah. Yeah. And so I think, and one of the first things I think everyone should do is jump on the show notes page. So if you're listening to this in the car, timtopham.com forward slash episode 12. And we'll put the link to uh, Kristen's video, which is really, really good. It gives you a really good indication of how all this works and the kind of meaning you can get from it. So start with that perhaps. And then uh, there'll be a section for comments under the show notes. Please leave your questions. uh, And I'll either ask Kristen if she can sort of respond to some of them if I can't help. So we can really, you know, just get as many people onto this as possible. And I would love to hear from you guys. uh, If you've tried it out, how did it go? And if you've got some tips for everyone, that would be really, really good. Now, um, we'll wrap it up. And I just want to talk about your, you've given away a great little cheat sheet, which I'll put on the show notes page too. It's the pop showcase checklist. Uh-huh. So this, is basically, this is just step by step. This is what we've been talking about. So if you're interested in this, grab that download. It's fantastic. And it just gives you a step, to, step by step. You can kind of tick the box as you go through and get organized, can't you? Yes. Yeah. Really, really yeah. good. Thank you very much. For it's a great outline. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. 
Uh, and look, before we go, we should talk about how they can find you online as well and the things that you do. So what's your website and all that kind of stuff? Well, I have two websites. So I have my company website, which has teaching how we run our music school. So that's um, centerformusicalminds.org and it's the British spelling of center. Um, and then my personal website, which has more of my professional like, presentations and things like that, um, available for teacher education is kristenyost.com. Great. And we'll put links to those two there too. And, right. and um, just before we, uh, we started recording, um, I was talking about your book, uh, yeah, and you mentioned that you've done a, an update, or you're currently in the process of doing that. Did you want to just let yes. people know about that because that sounds like a lot of fun? It is. Um, it ne- it was it was desperately needed. So uh, I went through and I updated all of the content to reflect the changes that have that have happened since it was originally published. And um, there's also an updated um, section of chapters that. It's basically saying, okay, so what's next? You've been, you've run a successful studio. You're ready to, you're thinking about making that jump. You're ready to make that jump from independent teacher to music school owner. And so there's a lot of great content in there. Um, and I actually have a lot of information that I contribute. I was a contributing author for David Cutler's book, The Savvy Music Teacher, which is coming out in September, I believe. Okay. So he has a lot of great information in there too. That David, piggybacks off of everything we've we've talked about today. David Cutler, was it? Uh-huh. Yeah. Okay. I'm gonna do some investigation. And yeah. uh episode seven as well. I interviewed Carly McDonald, I think it was episode seven, uh, in about the question was, you know, how, how do we actually start hiring other teachers if you want to build your studio? So that was that was you know, the similar kind of topic. So check out episode sure. seven if you haven't listened to that too. And I'll put a link to your new book when it comes out for sure. Yeah. That'd be great. Brilliant. Yeah, uh, well look. Fantastic speaking with you. Thank you so much for your time. As always, it's been a pleasure. And I look, I just can't wait till I'm back in the States and hanging out with you guys all again. It was great fun. Ladies and gentlemen, that will conclude this evening's entertainment. Oh, thank you. Thanks for listening to the Creative Piano Teaching Podcast. We'd love to help take your teaching to the next level as a member of our supportive community. Use the coupon Piano Podcast for $100 off an annual membership of Tim's Inner Circle today. To find out more, head to Tim Topper.